Chuk, with a total land area of about 50 square miles, is a home of half of the people in FSM, but its population is widely dispersed. About a third of its population resides on coral atolls outside the lagoon, Mortlocks, Patiu, Wita, and the Halls. The rest of the people live on small islands scattered over one of the largest lagoons in the world. In the eyes of many, Chuk is also the problem child of the nation. Chuk has been known all over for people fighting among themselves. And I know everybody's looking at Chuk as always and they're doing all the bad things. Money for their government is kind of, uh, they're, they're in trouble uh, misusing their money. Chuk is uh, the leading state in misusing funds for uh, health and education. But it wasn't always this way. During the early Trust Territory days of the 1950s, Chuk hosted the Central School for the entire Trust Territory. Health Services Headquarters was also located there. Before long, Chuk High School was providing a high-quality education for local students and a network of five junior high schools enabled many more young Chukis to get a secondary education. Meanwhile, a system of dispensaries was set up to provide health services for the geographically dispersed people of Chuk. The way I understand, they were uh, uh, established by the U.S. military when they first came in the Navy. Since there were few outboard engines at the time, most people would have had difficulty getting to the hospital by boat. Dispensaries were set up in key locations on every major island. Trained health aides were assigned to staff them, and medical supplies were replenished every two or three months. I remember when I was a, still a little kid on my island, and almost every field trip ship that comes out, it will receive at least one box of medicine for the dispensaries. A new hospital was built in the early 1970s, and many of the dispensary buildings were renovated. Training of health aides continued as well. Then came self-government in the late 1970s. Schools were no longer able to provide the quality education they once had offered. Health services, too, began to go into a long decline. This reversal of government services has been going on ever since. Here is the Chuuk State Hospital on Wana. Despite the fact that there are 78 village dispensaries scattered throughout the islands, many people still come here when they get sick. 
We here at Mike Sem decided to talk to a few of them to find out why. These two women come from islands with dispensaries. Why would they need to come to Wena? This couple from Fora should have a dispensary as well. The dispensary land was purchased by the government, but somehow the landlord reclaimed it. Yeah, we come. This woman lives near two dispensaries, Nukan and Inika. Yet most of the time she comes to the hospital because... These ladies live in a village where the health assistant works from his own home. They have come to the hospital because they don't really like this arrangement. After talking to these villagers, we decided to visit some of the village dispensaries to see for ourselves how well they operate and what their problems are. We began with the dispensaries on Fefen, Sis, and Toloas. Let's take a look at what we found. This is Urunno, a village at the northern end of Fefen. The village health assistant works out of his own house because there is no dispensary. Some years ago, this was a village dispensary. We were told that the land on which the dispensary was located was owned by the government. But this piece of land and the building on it were given to a Mortlock Ease in exchange for a piece of his property on Sadawan. Now the village has a health aid, but no functioning dispensary. Urungach village, a mile or two down from Ununno, has its own dispensary building. A former village chief donated the land for the dispensary, and the municipal government provided the funds to put up the building. Hermas Antonio is a health assistant here. He walks from his own village, Ununno, to Unangach every day to work at the dispensary. He is in the dispensary from morning to evening, except when he has no medicine for his patients. Here's what he has to work with. A bottle of Tylenol, a bottle of antibiotics, a stethoscope, and some medicine for diarrhea. Yeah, we a little further on is a village of Kuku. We spent some time here finding out about their dispensary and even had time to shoot a few baskets. Here's a building that served as a dispensary until a year or two ago. Pfeffin Municipality supposedly set aside $15,000 for the purchase. The owners claim that they received only one-third of that amount. So they shut down the dispensary and took back their land. As for the health assistant, she is seldom seen in the village. There's no dispensary building in Sapore either. The piece of property that the municipal government purchased for the dispensary was instead turned over to the new junior high school. But even if the land had been kept, there still wouldn't be any dispensary. The money allocated for its construction was used by the former mayor for other things, people say. At the end of a long climb, up a steep path, is a house that serves as a dispensary. The health assistant has been working out of his own home here ever since his dispensary was torn down. Mm -hmm. 
As for medical supplies, it's the same story here as everywhere else. There is almost nothing. Like everyone else, though, he is drawing a full salary for doing what he can with his meager supplies. Our next stop was a village of Nukan. After a long walk and a stop to ask directions, we finally came to the dispensary building. And Nukan, Ikea, Ita Nukan. Okay, so at dispensary. Instead of finding a health assistant inside, however, we found this fellow. Ah, it must be another land lease problem. We were told that the health assistant decided she would rather work in her own home. Unfortunately, she lives very far away. So what happens when people visit the nearby Puena dispensary? We asked about the other health assistant who was working here and found out that she's been in Hawaii for over a year now on medical referral. We also found out that she's still on the payroll. Our next stop was Seas, a small island off the southwest coast of Fethen with a population of 220. The entire population is Catholic. Not long ago, a new dispensary building was erected here, on leased land, land belonging to the present mayor of the island. The mayor's family have repossessed the piece of land on which a dispensary stands, and they have moved into the new building. <laughs> They claim that they never received the full lease payment for their land. Others say that they did. Whatever the case, the family says they will continue to live in the dispensary building until their own home, destroyed in a recent typhoon, is repaired. Meanwhile, the health aide, a nephew of the former mayor, is living on Wera. He was not on cease when we visited. If this is a case, it may be a long time before the people of Seas see him again. The problems on Fefen and Seas are not unique to those islands. This building was built to serve as a dispensary for Sapukwena. It was torn down in a dispute over the land. Later, a new dispensary was built in Wechop, at the other end of Wena. But the structure was never used. The landowners moved in and now use it as their home. During our visit to Tolowas, we had trouble finding the dispensaries. There are seven dispensaries listed by the Department of Health Services, five of them are staffed. But we were able to find only one building, a new structure built with Congress funds that has never been opened. We met only one of the health aides during our visit. She works out of her own house, like so many others, but we found her returning from a visit to a sick person.
In the early Trust Territory days, there were three dispensaries here, Kuchua, Erin, Saparong. They were strategically located to serve the entire island population. The buildings were nothing fancy, but they were regularly supplied with medicine. I remember in my village there was a dispensary that we shared. Almost the whole island had one dispensary. <laughs> And today? What they use of going to the dispensary when they don't have nothing. That's why every time they get sick, I'll always come to the hospital. The hospital, outpatient clinic, always crowded, crowded. It's no wonder people travel all the way to Wera when they're sick. The island dispensary system is not as effective as it once was. Why? The land on which many dispensaries are located is private land. The government is required to pay high leases for this land. The landowners will sometimes take back the land even when a lease has been signed. <laughs> Municipalities were given the funds to purchase outright land for dispensaries and schools, but many have failed to do so. Only half of Chuuk's dispensaries are on government-owned land, and many of those are in the outer islands. There seem not to be so many problems with the lands that have been outright purchased, but for those lands that the government is still using and still owe the landlord uh, money, they have problems. Another problem is that what is called a dispensary is often just a single room in a family home. The health assistants are placing uh, the dispensaries uh, at their convenience. They take them to their homes. Sometimes people from the village are hesitant to go to their health assistant's home because they don't want to disturb the family or more often because the house is quite distant from the main village. The rule of thumb seems to be where the health aide happens to live is where the dispensary is to be found. So few usable dispensaries, yet so many new health assistants. Health aides are multiplying faster than dispensaries right now. They increase their employees for uh, dispensaries. They always have like trainings and they keep those people. Some of these new health aides are political appointees who do not have a place to work from. Many are not trained for their work. The next rule of thumb, appointment of new health aides leads to the creation of new dispensaries, whether needed by the people or not. In addition, the government is paying for the services of some health aides who are not even living on the island they're supposed to be serving. They remain on the payroll even while residing abroad. But somehow we are kind of uh, taking it easy and taking it for granted that uh, we still can get paid if, even though we don't really do, do our job. I think more control should be, should be applied. Paying people who don't even work? It seems that money could be better spent. Medical supplies are short just about everywhere. The result is that the health aide cannot help his people, even if he's on the job every day. The health aides we met pleaded with us to try to get medical supplies for their work. Is your right on a antibiotic red amoxicillin and penicillin is your so even if the dispensary is open, the shelves are empty. Chuk State already has 78 village dispensaries, and new dispensaries are still being built. 
On top of this is a system of super dispensaries, each requiring major construction and four or five employees. We have this land already purchased, then they purchase another one, and then they purchase another, and a congressman will come in and purchase another one, and all this. Because it was never a plan that we say, well, sorry, but we already purchased one, only one dispensary. So, the government ends up paying for super dispensaries, as well as the expensive but poorly functioning village dispensary system. In short, the dispensaries are not viewed as a community service so much as an employment opportunity. And this government, I'm sorry, but this is what I believe. They believe that they will just go ahead and uh, hire this person because she's my relative or because she's from my island or because she's part of my party. Somehow priorities have been reversed. The health care of the villages appears less important than providing jobs for individuals. Salaries of health aides, ever increasing in number, and payments for leased private land are eating up most of the health services budget. There is little left over to purchase badly needed medical supplies. Instead of five dispensaries and spending all this amount of money on purchasing land and leasing my house, for this, the money that's supposed to help you to fill the shelf for medicine is being going to all this because, you know, we're building so many dispensaries. You know, you're not getting the benefit. All this makes it hard to provide basic health care for the people of Chuuk. But dispensaries are only one example of systemic problems in Chuuk government. The same problems are found in other areas as well. We have seen that there is no overall plan for the dispensary system. The same may be true in education. School annexes are built, elementary schools are expanded into junior high schools. Schools multiply along with teachers, leaving little money for supplies and textbooks. We seem to believe that the more schools and teachers, the better. Yet the test scores, the measure of the quality of education, remain very low. Is there a plan for education in Chuuk? You know what happens? I've been working under four different governors, or five, whatever the numbers. Each administration comes in with a totally different plan. They come in and they have, well, forget about that, we start this one. This one we come now, forget that, and we're going to start this one. Land is another problem that affects the school system and other government services. Yeah, there were schools that were actually closed because the landlord just came in and closed down the schools. Uh, and even the office here, uh, from time to time, this uh, landlord would just come and just close the door and we had to stay outside because of the, that uh, payment. The airport is another prime example. At one time this was public land. It was returned, however, and now the government must pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to lease it back. Government buildings, roads, and facilities all require land. Yet high-priced leases and land disputes are making it impossible for the government to deliver public services. Shouldn't the government take a strong stand to put an end to the budget drain from these lease payments? Lease payments may put money in landowners' pockets, but they cripple the government. Some of the dispensers I know were built by the government, local or state. Then the landowners still come in and chase everybody out and reclaim the property. And the sad thing about it is that nobody seems to look into the issue to rectify it or to correct it. Enforcement of the rules is difficult in Chuuk, everyone tells us. Whether protecting the government's rights to its own land or seeing that employees are not paid for doing nothing. Because maybe I decided to fire the person, but the people on the island, as well as the chief, 
are mayor on the island, they don't agree with me because they are the guy is their relative. We all would like to keep everyone happy. But at the expense of an effective government that can deliver the services its people need. And then there are the new positions created solely to benefit those hired. Uh, when we submit the budget, we already know who our staffs are. But sometimes when we receive the budget, uh, we, we can identify some insertions of names. Uh, some of them have the qualifications, but some don't have the qualifications. This political patronage affects more than just schools. There is insertion of uh, positions, not only in public health or in uh, hospital, health services. In all, almost all, especially police station, public safety. And I think it's education also. At a time when downsizing is mandated in every level of government, Chuuk State is training an additional 150 public safety officers, doubling the size of their police force. When money is already short, why do leaders hire new employees? Because you're looking for votes, right? Yeah, medicine don't vote, and just like books. Uh. Perhaps this kind of thing happens everywhere. Politicians always take care of their own. But there are usually limits to what people can expect through the informal patronage network. In Chuuk, the limits are stretched to the point of making it nearly impossible to provide basic government services. The government in Chuuk seems hard pressed to set limits and enforce a law. Perhaps this can be explained, at least in part, by the lack of political rule in the traditional Chuukese system. Chuuk politics is different from politics elsewhere. Before the beginning of the modern government system, Chuuk was a multitude of small independent villages. Each of these villages centered around a single founding lineage. Each was headed by a lineage chief who owed no obedience to any other. In the late 1940s, there were 99 villages throughout the Lagoon Islands, each one with a population of less than 100. 10,000 people divided into political units of a hundred with no higher authority. Even the smaller islands were split into villages. There was never any higher political authority in Chuuk. Alliances were formed between villages for warfare, but these were ever shifting and never enduring. Now and then, a figure would emerge who achieved prestige because of his local knowledge or prowess as a warrior. Such individuals commanded the respect of a wider group and might even unite the islands for a time. Petrus Milo was one of these. So was Tosuo Nakayama. But when they faded from the scene, Chuk was left with a divided population. It was foreign governments that established flag chiefs for each of the major islands in Chuk Lagoon. First the Germans, and then the Japanese. When Americans came, they introduced the modern political system that continues to today. There were municipalities, electoral districts, congressmen. This flourished as long as the foreign government kept a close watch on things. Any unity the Chuk had was imposed from without. Let's compare this with other places in FSM. Ponape and Kashrai and Yap had the same sort of village organization. Ponape had its dozens of villages around the main island. But these were grouped into chiefdoms under the leadership of a paramount chief with a royal line and a title system. Koshrai too had many villages, but over these villages there was an island chief known as the Tokoshra. 
Yap had 60 villages or more, with a village population that was as small as Chuk. But these villages were organized into networks, with some villages subordinated to others. At the top stood a few key villages whose chiefs were recognized as leaders of the entire island group. Chuk, alone of all the states in FSM, had no higher political structure in the days before Western contact. Its many villages had no political authority to resolve conflicts between them, to supervise the way resources were used, and to foster unity. What other societies could accomplish by chiefly rule, Chuki's village leaders had to do by negotiation. Regionalism is a fact of life in a politically fragmented society such as Chuk. Some people are sitting in the legislature and they think about the region instead of thinking about the old Chuk state. Everybody wants a share. Everyone looks out for his own. If there is uh, money, if there is CIP money, every region would like to have a piece. To deal with this, Chuk has adopted the practice known as Ichietu. This means breaking up something into small parts so that it can be distributed equally. Slicing a town into many pieces to please my relatives and my people of my island. So everybody is getting a little piece, nobody is full, nobody is satisfied. Nobody is satisfied, but in a society without chiefly rule, how else could resources be allocated? During Compact One, Chuk appropriated to the municipalities 40% of the CIP funds for municipal projects. This is a GATU in practice. No other state did this, because municipalities usually do not have good accounting systems and are more likely to waste money on projects that benefit only a few people. The mayors often would distribute the money they received in the same way, with a little money going to almost everyone. It she ate you again. For example, the councilmen, they have our CIP money in human municipality. So they meet and they fight among themselves. And they come to their section of the village and they cheat you. Say, here's your fishing project. Here's your farming project. Huh. Negotiation with others for their share. This has always been the key element in Chuki's government. In traditional times before the coming of colonial rule, and again after self-government. Negotiation with landowners over dispensary land, and over land for schools, and over land for the airfield, and for government offices. Negotiation with mayors over the distribution of funds and with every group in their municipality. Isn't this true everywhere? Yes, but in the other states there are people who have status independently, sons of chiefs and the like. There is a tradition of rule which imposes limits on what can be negotiated. Authority in Chuk, it seems, is bestowed by making alliances by expanding personal networks, by bestowing jobs, land payments, and other personal favors. This is how power is gained and kept. And we elect people with that attitude. I, 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 politics of Ichieti. We don't look at the bigger picture. In Chuk, as distinct from the other states, everything depends on personal ties and affiliations for there is no hierarchical political system. Its traditional political structures are surely part of Chuk's past, and they explain people's political expectations today. But some of this may have to be changed if the state is to meet the needs of the future. And that's why the first comeback was 
gone, and you don't see any development in Chuk. Chuk still the same thing after 17 years because of that demanding of individual projects. Chuki's people want an income, of course. They would rejoice at any measure that increases the number of jobs or offers them money for the land. And well they might, because the per capita income in Chuk today is lower than in any other part of Micronesia. It's about time yeah, we look at the benefit of the overall Chuk. If we're going to divide all that money among all the 40 municipalities, and all this. We'll, we'll never get a you know, benefit for everybody. It's me and my family and my relatives, and then it comes out to my constituents, and then the last is the community or the state. The people want their share, but they also want good health care and a decent education system. Many sense that the formula being used now is not providing the public services they hoped for. But will they accept fewer personal benefits for their own families as a price of improving public services? Elected officials often say that they are waiting for the people to change. They call for stronger efforts to educate the public, especially through the media. Democracy works better when people are well informed and educated. We need to go out there and teach the public. I think that's the most important thing, to go out there and teach. Unless the people are well informed, then we'll get their support. If they're not, we're going to keep demanding fiberglass boats and more Yamahas. But the people may be waiting for their leaders to show the way. To lay down strong rules that look to the good of the entire population, to model these rules in the way they themselves conduct business. So who makes the first move? I don't know. Who will offer the vision of a government that looks to long-range goals and to the broad interests of its people? Perhaps what Chuk needs is a political linkage of all those little villages under strong rule for the first time in its history. While consulting the interest of small communities, leadership would actually rule them. Some people may say we don't have strong enough leadership to achieve this. If that's the case, then we might have to turn over authority to someone else to do the job for us. Now, we can take your shortcut and say, just admit it, that we're bringing a, you know, another government institution like national government come and run everything. or we go through that, you know, painstaking process of, you know, building Chuk State. Chuk, a place of friendly people, smiling faces. Chuk, with its strong business community, its hundreds of stores, its well-maintained churches. Chuk, once nearly the capital of the Trust Territory, now the linchpin of FSM with half of its population. Chuk, which provided many of Micronesia's outstanding leaders in the long march to independence. Isn't it time for Chuk to once again take a leading role in nation building. To look beyond small interest groups toward a vision of the future. We know we need changes. To put action to make the changes. That's the challenge. And hopefully it will come from within. <laughs>